morning, everybody. It's great to be back in Austin. I actually lived here for about 24 years before I moved away to Colorado last summer. So it feels like I'm back home. And uh, it's great to reconnect with some of you that are local. Uh, so I have a brief amount of time to talk about a lot of things. So these slides are going to be posted afterwards so that you can go look at some of the slides in a little bit more detail than maybe what we have time to cover today. Uh, but my goal today is to share a little bit of insight with you from some of the clients that I work with. Uh, I do a lot of consulting for enterprise as well as software as a service companies, help them with their API program and strategy, and along the way I'm usually asked, what kind of API design style should I use? Should I use REST? Is REST old, outdated? Should we be looking at something else now? Is it GraphQL? Is it gRPC? Is it something else on the horizon we don't even know about? So one thing I want to first preface is this is not about a popularity contest, all right? If it's a popularity contest, then we would probably be just following the, the winds of change and not really thinking about what's appropriate for our business. And when I mean our business, I also mean our customers, our consumers, our developers. So the developers inside the organization, behind the firewall, building software solutions as well as outside when we externalize these APIs to different channel partners or to public developers in general. So the first thing that we really have to think about and remember is that APIs are meant to solve a lot of different kinds of use cases. So we have to bear that in mind before we make a decision about our API style. Uh, we may be, uh, as I said, dealing with customer experience, uh, back-end uh, worker experience with our, with our various staff or, or partner channels, and then we have different kinds of interaction styles we can pick from as well. We oftentimes debate a lot of different API design styles, but they all tend to fall in the re request response pattern. And that may be what we need for the majority of our endpoints, but we also have other options at hand to us. So to be able to figure out if REST is still relevant today, one of the things that I did is I went a little bit back in history, um, showing a little bit of my age. Uh, one of the things that I worked with early on was Corba. Anybody work with Corba? Yeah. It's a little early, I think, probably to start talking about Corba, but uh, I think it's important. And those of you that aren't familiar with it, just a brief introduction of Corba. It had a, a service description language. Uh, it's called an IDL. It defined the interface. It was kind of like header files for C. It defined what that interface was going to be like. And then uh, we implement it and deploy it into an object request broker, and it manages everything. So the point of Corba was to create interoperability between systems, even across programming languages, by externalizing objects. So we were taking an object and we were remoting it out. We then started seeing in the 2000s a move towards SOAP. How many have done SOAP? Yeah, so a lot of you have already seen that already. Uh, so SOAP allowed us to do internal integration of systems as well, but rather than looking at things as objects, we saw them as services. We could scale them up greater. We could even go across the firewall. And interestingly enough, uh, some of you may or may not know that SOAP actually could be invoked over email, over SMTP. We could use that as our protocol instead of HTTP. Or if we were internal to the organization, we could use something like JMS. So it was designed to work across multiple protocols, which means it had to be designed independent of those particular transport protocols it went over. And we could also do asynchronous calls as well. So we could push messages in via SOAP and then just go check up, follow up on the results later on or not even care what happened, just kind of a fire and forget scenario. Then we started to see uh, the growth of all of these uh, internet-enabled devices, and we have lots of iPhones and so on, so we started moving back to HTTP. We didn't want very expensive soap stacks, lots of middleware, so we shifted over to HTTP. So what I want to do briefly is in like about 90 seconds give you everything that I know about HTTP. How about that? Uh, here's what we really love to depend on from HTTP, and I think it's important to remind ourselves of this. Uh, we have URLs that allow us to define resource paths. We have verbs that allow us to tell the server how we want to interact and what kind of safety and item potence guarantees we need between the client and the server. We have headers that allow us to exchange details between the client and server about what the client's capable of and what the server was able to accomplish from the request that was sent in, and we have response codes. Those are the basics and those are the things we learn when we think about REST and just about any kind of HTTP API. We can then extend it and add in content negotiation. So now we can say, I can support JSON, I can support XML, I can add in some CSV, some PDF, I could send back some HTML representations if I wanted to, I could switch over to protobuf or anything else I want to do 
All I have to do is make sure my API can support it and tell my client how to inform the server what type or types that it can support and the server will try to accommodate that as best as possible. We can do the same thing with languages. So now we don't have to embed uh, uh, localization strings back into our responses and try to figure out how to negotiate that through the URLs or through the request payloads. We can actually use HTTP to do that. We also have caching. So caching we're very familiar with in the browser. We can allow the client to cache the data and we have cache headers that the server can inform the client about how long this resource representation should be able to live before you check to see if it's been updated. And we have e-tags that allow us to capture a hash or some sort of representation of that response to determine if anything has changed or not uh, and be able to compare that. We then have the ability to layer inside of HTTP and put intermediaries in between. So now we can extend the caching out to the edge, so that's where we get CDNs. And we have things like varnish that we might put internally versus having CDNs out at the edge. So we can get our data as close to the edge devices as we need to, all through HTTP. We can have conditional requests. So with conditional requests, we can take the e-tag or the last modified date or however we wanna choose to support that and allow us to figure out from the client side if anything's changed. So we don't have to go through a diffing logic on the client side to figure out if something's changed. We can use HTTP headers to figure that out ahead of time and figure out do we need to refresh the data or not. And we can even deal with concurrency control because we have more than one client, more than one device that's interacting with our API. We don't want to destroy data that was changed by someone else. So we can put in concurrency control. All of that's built into HTTP. So I think it's important to go back and review HTTP. I've actually written this up in a little bit more in depth, so just grab that URL, it's a two-part series. It talks about each of these different things that I covered in much more detail than I have now. So if it's something you wasn't familiar with or something that perhaps you uh, just need a refresher on, it's a great way to do that. So when we think about does choosing the API styles that we want to use and whether REST is the right thing, it's important to know the protocols that we're using. We oftentimes don't think about that. Uh, so what I wanna do is I wanna do a quick review of GraphQL, gRPC, we'll talk a little about REST and we'll also talk about notification and webhooks a bit uh, as time allows to uh, kind of see what's out there today and what is working and what's not. Now I am not gonna be slamming any one of these nor am I slamming REST. My goal is to show you what works and what doesn't. That's the goal of any great developer or architect is that we look and understand contextually what is being offered and then does that fit our specific use case, the context in which the consumers are gonna be using. So if you're looking for a smackdown, that's not what this is gonna be. But I do wanna draw out some positive and negatives of each. So with GraphQL, for those that may not have seen it, it allows us to have an expressive language to select the resources and specific fields within those resources that we wish to have from the client. So it's a very nice, robust way to do this. Uh, prior to GraphQL, uh, APIs like LinkedIn and others actually offered this kind of capability through uh, query parameters. You could include nested objects and select certain fields. So it's been done outside of GraphQL, but GraphQL created a little bit more of a standard around that. So it works well for scenarios when we have hierarchical data. It came from Facebook. Facebook deals with object graphs. So that's where it works really well. We can be very specific about what we're selecting. We can introspect uh, the, the file form or the uh, response types and all the different resources and fields and so on and know what their types are. So it's used heavily on front end APIs that need lots and lots of customization and want to be able to get very specific about what they want. The downsides, however, from what I've seen from my client implementations is that uh, we have limited security enforcement without really having to go in and code that up specifically. It's very much falling into the camp of SOAP where to build out middleware, we have to make the middleware understand the resources that are being sent across the wire, the context of the payload. They have to understand your application. We can't just transparently put something in and block some URLs, block them at the verb level and so on. We have to actually overcome that in different ways. Uh, there are some really nice tooling, but there is a lot less uh, tooling options that exist over things like HTTP, if we just look for standard HTTP tooling. Uh, but the biggest things that I'll really want to draw out are the last two. Because GraphQL uses POST, it is just like SOAP. You're not going to be able to cache any of the responses. 
So you're not gonna get any kind of caching down to the edge. So if that is something you need on the front end, then maybe GraphQL may not be the right solution for you. In addition, GraphQL is gonna be constrained to specific content types. You're not gonna be able to use content negotiation to just kind of move to any content type you want. So it does have some limitations. So with that in mind, we can make that decision. Is GraphQL the right fit for what we're trying to offer up? The next one on the list is uh, gRPC. Uh, gRPC looks a lot like CORBA. It has an IDL, they even call it an IDL, it's the service definition, and then we can, that combined with protobuf, run it through some code generators and get our back-end boilerplate and our front-end client code, pretty nice. Google uh, Cloud uses their SDK, uses gRPC. Uh, it started heavily internally where they needed high performance. It uses HTTP2, it has bi-directional communication, so oftentimes we see this deployed inside an organization more often than outside. Uh, typically, we want something that's very high performance, low latency. It kind of goes back to those previous days of having these persistent socket connections to services because HTTP2 affords us to be able to have long connections with bi-directional communication. It feels a little bit more like client network or client server uh, in the traditional sense. A little bit harder to scale though. Uh, so it has a lot of code generation built in, but the downside is that we're dependent on the code generators to do the right thing. We're only as good as the code generators we use. So you do have to do some investigation into the languages you anticipate and supporting. If you have a lot of languages, a broad developer base you have to support, you're gonna have to get to know those code generators well, really well and know what the nuances are, because they may not generate code exactly as you would expect for different languages. In addition, very much like uh, GraphQL, we have to deal with cacheability issues. Uh, we, we are not gonna be able to cache as much. The bi-directional communication does give us some advantages, but we lose a lot of that, as well as flexibility of content types because it it's, uh, um, just has a specific, uh, specific one that he uses. So we have GraphQL, which would be great for front end, gRPC, which might be good for the back end. So we have some different options. Now let's go back to REST and think a little bit about what we can do. When I talk about REST, I do not talk about CRUD, okay? CRUD is a resource lifecycle pattern that we can apply on top of REST, the REST constraints. When I talk about REST, I'm really talking about these constraints. These are the core constraints that come out of Fielding's paper. Fielding looked at HTTP and how we were using it and said, gee, Git and Post are great, but you know, we did a lot of Support, built a lot of support in HTTP to do a lot of things. And here's what I see. I see people tunneling protocol semantics inside of HTTP when they could really just use HTTP. One of the biggest examples uh, that I think exists out today is the ability to layer and apply cache constraints. Um, layering is really important. You may or may not really think about how much happens in the HTTP world with, with uh, layering. We have application, um, application servers on the back end or different kinds of processes, and then we put all kinds of things on the front end. We can put load balancers, reverse proxies like Nginx, Apache, Varnish, HAProxy, things like that. Uh, we can push out CDNs and do the same thing out on the edge. The CDNs can then protect us from layer three, layer four, distributed denial of service attacks. Right? They can do all of those things because HTTP allows us and affords us the ability to communicate between all these intermediaries and there's an understanding about HTTP between all those intermediaries along the way. We don't have to parse the payload and understand the semantics of that protocol that's custom for your uh, API different than anybody else's. As long as we adhere to the HTTP specs, we gain a lot of advantage. So if you come away from what I'm talking about today uh, with nothing else, think beyond your laptop. It's more than just the code that you're writing, right, and the client that's gonna consume it. There's a lot that goes on in the middle. There's a lot to operationalize about APIs. And so it may fire up and you get something up and running in five minutes on your laptop and you go, man, this is the best thing ever. But what's it take to put it in production, to monitor it, to manage it, to secure it, and to make sure that your organization is not compromised because you're putting a lot of semantics uh, in the middle that become more surface area exploits or more opportunities for bugs to emerge. 
Uh, the other big thing that we don't really talk about in REST, unless you're kind of the, in that Restafarian camp, is more of like the idea of hypermedia. And hypermedia is kind of, a lot of people go, well, who cares about the links that are embedded? One of the things that we are seeing now is that APIs are now meeting people where they need to get stuff done, that jobs to be done that was, that was raised yesterday by one of the speakers. We have this idea that things need to get done by our workforce. And today, more than ever, we are now using messaging channels like Slack and HipChat and others to communicate amongst each other. So now we're not just double clicking on an icon on our desktop or clicking a bookmark or something from in our web browser. We're actually now involved in these messaging environments where we could start making decisions. So our workforce workflow is now extended beyond the original apps they were built for. We're taking the APIs and we're bringing the decisions to wherever the people are at when they're trying to get things done. So from the API perspective, if all we're doing is CRUD, then we're just sending data back and forth, but we're not informing these new devices and messaging channels how to talk to our API. So hypermedia will tell these different kinds of devices and interfaces what kinds of things can you do? What's capable based on the current role you are at? What are your affordances or your capabilities? What is allowed to be done at a certain time? And that is all because we build on HTTP, we use the URLs, and we design URLs that reflect some sort of abstract resource concept that we then can interact with via our APIs. Because we can have those unique URLs, we're able to message to the client what can be done and can't be done. And if there's a rule that changes in the business that says now uh, a regular uh, standard user level access can no longer do something or can now do something, those links can immediately reflect that, hopefully without any kind of client change. So we don't have to go through the App Store, um, Play, Google Play, or anything else. So there's a lot of opportunity to drive next generation APIs for the types of problems we encounter every day by going back and revisiting HTTP and kind of starting to understand more about REST beyond just that CRUD life cycle that we tend to focus on so heavily. Uh, so with the, oops, with the remaining time, what I want to do is talk briefly about webhooks. Uh, anybody uh, familiar with webhooks? Yeah, yeah, okay, good. So you're, you're already familiar. The, the big case that I think most of us are aware of are things like GitHub. Uh, I know our Zapier friends know webhooks in and out more than you can imagine, so go talk to them if you really want to know some, some deep details about webhooks because they deal with it every day. GitHub created an entire marketplace with one webhook. Their webhook that informs people whenever there's a new commit push to, to your repo has opened the door for software as a service CI CD pipelines. Before we would have had to install them in our own data centers or in our cloud somewhere, uh, it has created an entire marketplace that didn't exist before. We now have server side events that are allowing us to stream events back to the client. There's other options as well. And we're also seeing things like Kafka driving log based storage and notification of data inside the enterprise, inside the organization to be able to message stream things out to those that are interested. So when we look at and survey everything that we have, we can almost see things repeating again. We did HTTP most recently and, and now we can start seeing our opportunity to extend the rest. We did SOAP before and now we have kind of a combination of, of GraphQL and webhooks that kind of mimic that in some way. Uh, we have Corba that's now just gRPC. Re is, gRPC is Corba reincarnated, I guess is the best way to say it, uh, that's modernized and it's able to scale more because we're not externalizing an object that's more of a, of a traditional service. But we have all these different options. So with that, are APIs, REST APIs still relevant? Does it make sense? Uh, I'd say yes, but I'm going to caveat that, and this is what I'm going to end with. Uh, first, we need to understand the business problem. I see way too many discussions about technology before we know what we're really trying to solve. So we need to understand what we're trying to solve first and then pick the style that makes the most sense to fit that solution. We need to become better educated on HTTP. Don't depend on your coding frameworks to give you what you need. Start reading the RFC, start understanding them, or start reading articles that do deep dives into them so that you can make a little bit more sense of it. Because too often I see people putting the protocol semantics into their response payloads or into their request payloads. 
to overcome something for which HTTP has already solved, and they start mixing the idea of the, the resource representations with their protocols. Number three, it's a challenge for all of us that are involved with any kind of library whatsoever, contributing back or utilizing these tools that we use, the frameworks that we have. We need to involve them. Most frameworks that help us stand up an API make a lot of assumptions about what we're doing and don't really involve a lot of the extra HTTP semantics that we need. Uh, I don't know how many frameworks offer up Java annotations or helper libraries or anything else to set cache control headers easily without having to actually know about them and set them. Are they in the documentation? Do they guide developers through that as you start to become more and more familiar with that framework? Uh, do we have provisions for being able to generate hypermedia uh, message styles and so on? So our tools need to get better so that we can use these things uh, uh, more easily. Uh, number four, like I said, think beyond the laptop. Think about what it's gonna take to operationalize your API. You might be building an API between two systems or something you're gonna, gonna use internally, but as we learned yesterday by several speakers, talking about API security is, is the utmost importance to know that you can insert logging, analytics, security, access management, all those pieces in place. Uh, if you don't have that, you, you might end up in a headline someday. And finally, stop using verses. I played that game with the Java versus .NET. I, I've joked around with that with Vim versus Emacs, right? We've done that before. It's a no-win situation. Uh, it's kind of like uh, in the end of war games where the computer finally figures out that maybe not playing that game is the best choice. Quit playing the versus game and play the and game. Figure out what style or styles will accommodate the developers that you're targeting, the solutions that you're building that ad ad address the channels that, that you're building APIs to support. That's what I have. Thank you.